Distinguished delegates, uh, dear colleagues, um, welcome back from the break. This is a very important segment of our council meeting this week, and I'm particularly proud to be able to moderate this session because this is all about uh, what we call our flagship publication, the World Migration Report, and I think you'll shortly receive a copy of this fairly weighty tome. <laughs> uh, and I think one of the most interesting and important World Migration Reports that we've done since we started producing these in the year 2000. Um, it speaks to the question of how we make sense of migration in an increasingly interconnected world that often seems very disconnected to us. So I think you'll find this volume very interesting. We have a, a, a group of very, very qualified and eminent speakers here. Let me first make a few, very few brief remarks because you're here to hear the speakers. You've probably heard enough of me already today. <clears throat> but I would like to set the scene by reminding us all again that we are living in a world on the move and that we, uh, more than any other time in history, um, migration has become part of our life in a more conscious way than perhaps in the past. It is the quintessential cross-cutting issue. And I'm very fond of IOM's mandate. I think it's the best mandate in the European, in, in the, uh, of the entire UN family because literally migration touches everything and there's very little that we cannot do under that mandate if member states or migrants find it necessary. So I won't give you the figures again. You've had all the figures about the billion people on the move, et cetera. <clears throat> but what is clear is, but is now being covered over by a very poisonous climate is that migration historically has always played a significant role in improving lives of people, whether in their home society or their host society. Migrants are development agents. And I have never understood the debate in New York at the UN about whether there is or is not a nexus between migration and development. Of course there is. We see it every day. So I, as far as I'm concerned, the debate is, is over. Um, <clears throat> okay, take the 3.3% of the world which consists of international migrants. If we listen to the McKinsey Global Institute's latest report, and it's gotten the attention of all the migration scholars and gurus, they tell you 3.3% of the world's population, migrants, produce 9% of global GDP, which is 4% more than they would have produced if they'd stayed home. So I, as far as I'm concerned, that is a key point, that migrants are development agents. Now, it's not just a question also, uh, people are, yes, remittances are important, and yes, 429 billion U.S. dollars go back to developing countries every year. That's important, and that is a contribution, but they're making social remittances, the talent they bring back. Uh, we always hope that every migrant who decides to return home will either bring back an enhanced skill or a new skill or money to invest. And there's absolutely no contradiction between being totally integrated in the local society, host society, and being an active member of the diaspora. We're talking about brain circulation. Second point, migrants in crisis, we have to be particularly attentive to them because we have the largest number of migrants along vulnerable pathways and facing trouble, about 66 million that we've had since the Second World War. Third and final point is the, the emphasis of the World Migration Report is on the contribution of migrants 
uh, contribution of the, the, con the contribution of the World Migration Report to migrants and migration policy. Uh, we've done these reports now since 2000. This is one of the uh, most important ones we've done. It's taken on heightened importance in a period of information overload, fake news, where you don't know what to believe. This, I think, you can take as something that you really can work on. Uh, this report is designed to demystify and demythologize migration based on evidence and facts. So we acknowledge uh, here the continuing emphasis on migrants' rights and paying closer attention to migrants in need of assistance. So let me close off quickly there and start by introducing, first of all, particularly pleased and honored to have Ambassador Sarah, a personal friend and a great friend of IOM. Thank you, Ambassador, for your support, and we'll come back to you very shortly. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to having your insights and grateful for the time you've taken and the honor you've given us of being with us. But I would like to ask my colleague, uh, Ms. Marie uh, McAuliffe and Dr. Ruse, to give us a brief overview of what we're talking about in this volume, which I guess you'll get shortly, right? Exactly. You'll receive this shortly. Thank you. So over to you, Marie. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Director General, for that warm welcome and uh, elucidating uh, discussion on migration generally. It's an absolute privilege to be able to address the 108th session of IOM Council on the new World Migration Report. We wish to thank the Director General and IOM senior leadership team for their leadership of this body of work, for their strong support of and commitment to building the evidence base on migration as a means to inform effective policy and practice and the World Migration Report as part of this evidence base. We would also like to thank Ambassador Sarah for being on the panel today, as well as Deputy Permanent Representative Luki Luquia, who has at the last minute stepped in. So thank you very much indeed. We'd also like to thank the many practitioners, the scholars, IOM colleagues who contributed to the final report. It's a highly collaborative process and we are very grateful for their input. Let me start by saying that this World Migration Report has been written for you and it's been written for the people that work for you, for the policy officers, for the research assistants, for the visa officers, the consulate staff and the media and communication specialists the ones who work for you and advise you and your governments. It's also been written for migration practitioners working to support and assist migrants out in the field, including those who have been displaced. It's been written for the researchers and the students too, for master's students, for example, studying migration at universities in Oslo, in Washington DC, in Dakar, in Kuala Lumpur, in Buenos Aires, in Shanghai, as well as the many thousands of people studying migration elsewhere around the world. And it's also been written for people beyond these groups who want to learn more about migration and about migrants. This is an awfully lot of people, all with different needs and different levels of knowledge of migration. But such is the readership of information and analysis on migration these days. As we know all too well, interest in migration continues to increase. And so we have sought to strengthen our World Migration Report series so that it's better suited to meet the needs of a growing readership. <coughs> this new World Migration Report is the ninth in the series, but it's the first to be published as a revitalized series. As the organization's flagship publication, the new series has been designed for its wide readership in a way that brings together both current information on migration trends and dynamics, as well as analysis of some of the more topical and complex migration issues. There we go. In revising the World Migration Report series, we recognize the importance of partnerships and of the need to complement IOM's programmatic, its operational and technical work and expertise with that of other practitioners as well as migration policy scholars. This has been done through a number of means, including co-editing, including co-authoring, as well as a review of the draft report by experts prior to finalization. 
We're also mindful of expectations. This is the first World Migration Report, of course, as the UN Migration Agency, and we take that responsibility very seriously. We have been very focused on needing to ensure the report content is accessible, that it's balanced, that it's relevant, and it makes a strategic contribution, including by offering a two-part structure, which we'll talk through in a moment. We've also focused too on accessibility in terms of a digital platform and we've developed a World Migration Report, very simple actually, web page, which enables people to download different chapters and different levels of material according to their needs. Oops. There we go. This is the table of contents equivalent of the World Migration Report 2018. Part one is on key data and information on migration. There are three substantive chapters in part one. It looks a lot smaller than part two, but in actual fact it is half because there is a lot to say about a global overview of migration and migrants. We talk about regional dimensions and developments and we go into research and analysis. And as our Director General mentioned earlier, in an era of fake news and information overload, this is particularly important and this will help us in our work that's designed that way. I will quickly take us through part one, and then my co-editor, esteemed colleague, uh, Professor Ruse, will uh, take us through part two to give you an overview. Future editions of the World Migration Report are expected to cover salient issues in part two. They will change from report to report. Part one will essentially remain pretty much the same, and it will be an update. But part two can cover a whole range of different issues, such as environmental migration. There might be issues coming up about migrant health. There might be uh, areas that we need to look into in regards to counter smuggling and trafficking and looking at the state of play and the current evidence and what it means for policy. So we've got some flexibility in terms of part two, knowing that they are also fairly succinct chapters. We don't have time to read a 250 page report on one topic. These are designed to enable policymakers and practitioners get the latest evidence, the latest information on a specific topic. Now, in terms of part one, the first substantive chapter is a global overview. It provides global data and trends on international migrant stocks, as well as international migration flows. There's a discussion of some specific migrant groups, but we've also incorporated, and this is a fairly new thing, incorporated IOM programmatic and operational data, including on assisted voluntary return, including on the work that IOM does in regards to resettlement. We're not uh, arguing that this is representative, that it's not global in nature, but it gives you a very good idea of how IOM's work fits into the changing nature of international migration. Chapter three is a fairly substantive chapter. Let me just say, it is an overview of the key migration statistics by region. So it is a cascade effect. We look at the global uh, picture in regards to international migration and migrants. And then we actually look at the regional dimensions. We cover the six world regions as determined by the United Nations, Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, the Caribbean, as well as North America and Oceania. We provide key statistics at the regional level, and then we provide descriptions, narrative descriptions on key features and developments at the regional and sub-regional levels. We know that migration dynamics is heavily related to geography, so we go into discussions on particular sub-regions. And it depends on what's going on within that sub-region as to whether we highlight labor migration and remittances, irregular migration, smuggling, displacement. It depends on the sub-region. Finally, for part one, we have provided a substantive chapter on migration research and analysis. This chapter really provides the last two years of written information and analysis on migration. It looks at some of the big uh, producers, academia, governments, intergovernmental organisations and think tanks. We look at key contributions, we look at growth over time, which has been very significant, 
and we look at the relative strengths and weaknesses and how different producers uh, publish material. We also explore opportunities for further leveraging policy and practice and how the two spheres can work together and we encourage that. Critically assess, uh, assessing the material in terms of rigour, in terms of its trustworthiness, in terms of its relevance, is very useful for us in our work when we're drawing upon the growing body of published research and analysis on migration. It's particularly important given that in rapidly evolving research and publishing environments, the prevalence and reach of succinct analysis in the forms of things like blog articles, for example, is on trend to increase. Finally, uh, I would like to suggest that overall, part one of the report has been provided as a reference. It's something to dip into and to refer to as you go about your work, assisting migrants, formulating policy, advising governments and others. It's intended to very much support people working on migration, as well as people who are studying migration and maybe future leaders on migration. Just before I hand over to Professor Ruse, it's worthwhile recalling comments made by Ambassador Quinn in the opening session. And he referred to the values that are placed on IOM in terms of its agility, how it operates in a low cost environment and it operates on a problem solving basis. And I would just like to finally reassure you that that extends to research and analysis and producing the World Migration Report too. We have been very grateful to the governments of Italy and the governments of Norway for their financial support, but we do work in a tight environment and we are constantly working on how to produce the best material with our partners, with our colleagues in academia and practitioners in the most effective and the most efficient manner. I'll hand over now to Professor Ruse Just and he can take word. us through part two. Say a word. Sure. Uh, one of the reasons that we wanted uh, Ms. McAuliffe to be head of our Migration Research Division uh, was because of her 20 years of experience as a migration specialist uh, in, many, in many manifestations of that, migration practitioner, uh, program manager, senior official, and scholar. And one of the things she's done is to get us a good partner uh, in, uh, in Dr. Martin Ruse from, uh, from Oxford. Uh, so uh, Martin, it's a pleasure to welcome you here. Uh, Dr. Ruse is the associate professor of political economy at Oxford University and the co-editor, as Murray mentioned, uh, with the, uh, the World Migration Report. His research uh, focuses primarily on economics and politics of international labor migration with a strong international comparative dimension. So, Dr. Ruse, it's a pleasure and honor to have you here. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, Director General, General Swing, for the introduction. And I would like to thank the IOM for giving me the opportunity to co-edit this uh, report. And in particular, I'd like to thank uh, Mari on my right um, for uh, doing this uh, job with me. It's been, as Mari mentioned, it has been a big collaborative project with a large number of researchers and experts contributing from around the world. So we are very grateful to everybody who has worked long and hard uh, to make this publication uh, possible today. Uh, as Marie mentioned, chapter part two of this report is uh, meant to be a flexible part that will change with each uh, new and upcoming World Migration Report in the future. It um, includes a series of chapters um, authored externally, so to speak, by uh, academics and researchers from all around the world. And the chapters discuss what we have called uh, complex and emerging migration issues. Now, the choice of the topics is necessarily selective and to some extent subjective. However, what um, is common to all the chapters is that they speak to what we think are some of the most important and prominent uh, migration issues and debates today. They all deal with um, complex issues. Now, many of you will know that academics always say the world is very complex and we need to think long and hard. But it is, of course, true today that many of the public debates that we see are highly simplified and effective policies are undermined by a view of migration that is not nuanced enough. 
So all the topics in this second part uh, deal with complex issues that um, cannot be solved or addressed easily. There's no one magic solution. So what we try to do with these chapters is to contribute to debates in three ways. So the chapters, each chapter, first of all, identifies what the key issue and policy challenge is. And a lot of debates that we have, of course, are problematic because we disagree on the nature of the problem, nature of the issue. So I think if we can agree and clarify what the issue is, that is already a huge step forward. Secondly, each chapter brings to bear uh, some of the relevant research and analysis that might be helpful to addressing the challenge. So we include research and review research from around the world, but we also use a large number of real world examples and, and illustrations from different areas of the world that bring alive uh, the issues uh, that we, we talk about. And we've taken great care to draw from examples from all, all around the world. And thirdly, the chapters discuss the implications for policy debates. Now, the chapters are not meant to be, and they are not prescriptive. They're not saying, they're not proposing a solution to some of the issues, but they're meant to be informative and, and stimulating. And really the emphasis is very much on trying to better understand the issue better understanding the dynamics of the problem in order to then facilita facilitate a more systematic debate of these very contested issues. Now, as Mari mentioned, all the chapters are downloadable individually, uh, and in a way, they're all fairly self-contained. However, I'd just like to highlight two, two key themes in a way that run through the chapters. And they're both obvious points in some ways, but they're frequently forgotten in policy debates, so I think it's worth uh, uh, emphasizing them. Now, one key issue that comes up again and again is, is the importance of recognizing the many variations in migration and its impacts and policy responses across space, so across different countries, across demographic groups, uh, and across different levels of government. If we, for example, if you want to discuss a common policy, a global policy, of course it is very important to understand, agree on what the policy variations across borders are and what that means for trying to come up with a common approach. And the second key issue that runs across is the issue of interconnections between across space, so immigration, immigration, transit countries, for example, Interconnections between different types of migration, labor migration, refugees, student migration, interconnections between um, migration and wider public policy issues. One of the points that I make in almost any uh, public policy forum is the importance of not discussing migration in isolation of other public policy issues. If we talk about migration, we have to talk about labor markets, we have to talk about development, we have to talk about lots of other issues. So what the report does is try to make these linkages in a very explicit, explicit way. So in the few minutes that remain, I will just very briefly um, give you an overview of um, what is in part two of the report. Uh, now, chapter five uh, deals with uh, global migration governance, and I'm not going to uh, read out uh, what's on the slide. You can see the kinds of issues that are covered in this report. I will just say that the chapter provides a, a fairly frank and, and, and objective analysis of the barriers to greater global governance and the opportunities. Uh, I think we agree that uh, governance in the area of migration is much more limited than in some other aspects of globalization, such as trade. However, in recent years, there has been a lot of progress. There has been stepwise step progress. And uh, many people argue that migration is an inherently global issue. Therefore, it follows that we need more global governance. While this is true to some extent, of course, we need to work harder than that. So the report in this chapter goes beyond that statement and analyze, analyzes which specific issues lend themselves to global governance. Where can global governance really make a difference in a way that also benefits individual member states and not just the world community as a whole. Chapter six um, is, I think, a very innovative innovative uh, a chapter um, that looks at the relationships between transnational connectivities, especially advances in telecommunication technologies and mobility and migration. 
Uh, we all know that we have had, uh, sh we have lived through huge changes in transportation technology, telecommunication technology, the rise of smartphones, and these changes have had important implications for migration processes and different migration actors. So what this chapter does is really discuss what do these changes mean for migrants themselves, for example, in the way they access information, in the way they move around the world in terms of the decisions they make. What do these changes mean for non-state actors, such as civil society, but also for smugglers? And what do these changes mean for states in their efforts to control and manage migration? And the chapter gives examples uh, based on, on research findings that critically discusses all these implications. Um, there's one chapter that makes the important point that really to understand migration in a more comprehensive way and to have more effective policies, we really need to understand migration from migrants' perspectives. Um, I'm an economist and an economist are probably one of the worst offenders when it um, comes to making assumptions about the behavior of migrants. Migrants move in response to wage differences, for example. But of course, we know that migrants are active actors. They make decisions, um, even among types of migration that are often classified as forced migration, there's often an element of choice. There's a spectrum of agency at different types of constraints that migrants have when they leave their countries, in, in the transit country and in the country of destination. So what this chapter does is highlight the importance at looking at the decisions that migrants make and at better understanding what these decisions and these processes mean for policy making. Um, chapter 8 looks at uh, media reporting of migrants and migration. Now, uh, media is obviously a very important filter uh, for the information that comes at us, information about migration and, and other issues. Media can be related in important ways to public opinion and, of course, policy um, making processes. Um, by and large, media migration is often, but not always, media coverage of migration is often, but not always, negative. Again, the chapter goes beyond the simple statement and the wish to see better coverage by asking what exactly explains that. We really need to understand how newspapers and new types of media behave, what drives them to report on migration in particular ways. And this is what this chapter does. It also looks at journalistic practices in different parts of uh, the, the world. Chapter nine, the penultimate chapter, looks at migration, violent extremism, uh, extremism and social exclusion. Now this, of course, is, is a highly controversial issue, but it is a very important issue to talk about in an evidence-based way, precisely because we see arguments being made all the time in the public sphere about the alleged links between migration and the threat of violent extremism. So it is a sensitive topic that must be discussed using the available data um, in the most systematic way and not based on, on anecdotes. And so what the chapter does is it puts in perspective and it provides an analytical framework for understanding the links between uh, migration, migrants, and um, violent extremism. And it, it does three things. It talks about the importance of definitions and data. Too much of the debate is so confused by uh, being unclear about who are we talking about. Are we talking about migrants? Are we talking about refugees? Are we talking about settled communities? Are we talking about citizens? And about terminology. It presents a typology of intersections between migration and violent extremism. It, it highlights that migrants are, of course, much more likely to be victims of violent extremism than drivers. And it talks about the issue across the migration cycle. So that means uh, extremism as a driver of displacement, radicalization and camps, risk of infiltration of asylum migration flows, and after arrival issues such as social inclusion. And the final chapter uh, to finish off looks at migrants and cities. Now this chapter is a little bit different from the remaining chapters in the second part in the sense that it is a follow-up chapter. Um, those of you who remember the previous uh, World Migration Report was dedicated entirely to the issue of 
migration and cities. And we felt that it is important to keep up the momentum of the issue to follow up with a chapter that talks about more recent research advances and policy implications in this area. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ruse. Uh, we've now had two interesting overviews from our colleagues, uh, who, the co-authors of this volume. And I would now like to welcome His Excellency Mr. Maurizio Enrico Luigi Serra, the Ambassador of Italy here in Geneva, and give him the floor, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much, Director General. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's always a delight and a honor to be part of the IOM family. And uh, I have to say also that I bring it to you all the best wishes and greetings from Under Secretary for Social Affairs, Giro, who is in Abidjan. You may understand why. Uh, it is not too close to Geneva. I wished to be able to, to be here with us, but send his best wishes. But first and foremost, let me tell you that I'm very moved that this uh, uh, report, of which I will say a few words, is uh, uh, culminating with uh, the extraordinary authoritative tenure of office of Director General Swing. I think, Director General, that for your successor, it would be an extremely difficult task to equal your achievements, and I would say it would be humanly, I think, very difficult, if not impossible, to surpass it. Now, turning to the um, report, uh, my, my Congratulations obviously go to the authors and to the outline of the theme. You said that it has physical weight. I would say that it has intellectual weight of such a level and comprehensiveness that makes it almost impossible in a few minutes to address all the issues or even the most important issues that are uh, included in uh, uh, this report. Let me just say one word on uh, the need of uh, having even a wider distribution of the document. I was, I had the honor of being uh, for a few years the director of a diplomatic institute in my Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and such materials, particularly also if I can be downloaded chapter by chapter, uh, of uh, relevance for, for young colleagues who turns to these issues. And then in order to, since it is, as I say, impossible to answer with uh, the same comprehensiveness, and I would like just to mention a few, to make a few bullet points to fertilize our debate later. And uh, I would start with a premise. I'm uh, one of the oldies in the diplomatic community in Geneva in the sense that I'm terminating my fourth year, which is between three and four, as we know, the normal diplomatic stint. And I have to say that I've been very impressed, positively impressed, to see, particularly in the last two years, uh, the place that the issues related to migration have taken in our works in all walks of the Geneva activities. Geneva is, as we know, as should be better known uh, uh, abroad, uh, the largest multilateral hub in the world, and I don't see any of the major, and even the other, organization here that cannot be encompassed in that connectivity and this cross-fertilization on the debate on migration. And that is because, in fact, the three key areas that are subdivided in these chapters are areas we when we work daily here. The first one is the, what I would say, the mega trend of people in the move. And people in the move request answer of a societal nature, of an extraordinary societal nature that invests the fabric of all our countries. It is a real cross-regional commitment that we have towards that, be it country of origin, country of transit, or countries of destination. We are all together in this endeavor, and the success will depend on the capacity that we will have to work together and to forge answers. And I would say that on this, the main key areas that request an overarching um, uh, interconnected approach are really those of um, health, education, and labor. These are the three main pillars, it seems to me, yeah. of integration. And obviously, that in 
implies, and this is the second bullet point of my intervention, an active campaigning against forms that unfortunately are creeping up in all our societies, all our societies, of uh, stigmatization and exclusion. We should be able to send more and more, I'm talking now for my country particularly, a positive message about the challenge, the opportunity, in economic terms, first of all, uh, migrant work uh, produces 8.9% of the GDP of Italy nowadays, 8.9%. <laughs> it's enormous. Uh, we Italians, where we were migrants, have contributed <laughs> hugely to the GDP of other countries of the world. So, I mean, yeah. it, is, it is a challenge. It has to be seen and addressed both ways, and has to bring all the opportunities that we can. It is not only a problem that we can treat in law enforcement approaches. We need a vast uh, campaign. The third, the third point that I would like to make, and the final one, concerns what I find particularly stimulating in, I, 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 I hadn't myself devoted enough thought uh, before reading this, and it is, I would say, the cultural dimension of, uh, of uh, the issues of, the, in, in another room here in, uh, in this building, we are debating issues of minorities today. <laughs> and although the two things are different, nevertheless, there is the necessity of going toward a better cultural perception of the culture of migrants, of the culture of minorities, and of their interconnectivity with our realities. So all in all, I think that these were some of the few points that one can evoke in, a, in the choice of a, of a basket of thought provocative and uh, really very fertilizing issues that come out of this document. So thank you very much for having invited me here, and congratulations for this excellent World Migration Report 2018. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. It's a great honor to have you here, and, and I see you here in so much of what you say, the, your, your long experience in senior positions, including uh, Ambassador in Paris to UNESCO and long, long periods with the, the presidency of Italy, Italian presidency of the G, G8, et cetera. So I'm, I'm really, I think this gets us off to, you know, to a very good start here. I, I want to also, if I might, then also pass down the line to my right to, to introduce and welcome and thank uh, 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 the ambassador of Uganda, Ambassador uh, Lukuya, uh, who's the permanent representative here and who's just joined us. Thank you very much for coming, and I'd like to give you the floor now, if I may. Thank you. you uh, thank you, uh, Director General, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm quite uh, delighted to be part of uh, this important launch of the World Migration uh, Report 2018. Uh, I think uh, this is because the year 2018 is a very important year for, for all of us. Uh, we are entering into a period of uh, establishing uh, the global compact on migration uh, on migrant, and this will put in place a framework uh, with which we are going to work for uh, years to come. I think, in this respect, the World Report on Migration uh, will definitely uh, make an important uh, input in that uh, process for all of us. Um, Uganda is very, very grateful, and we thank uh, IOM for having uh, publish this report, and we also thank all those who uh, have contributed in one way or another to uh, putting together this important report. And uh, indeed, this report 
comes at a time when migration is not only uh, the, the subject of sharp focus for policymakers, uh, politicians, and the media, but also at a time uh, uh, when the number of migrants and those displaced from their homes is at an all-time high. Given the ever-increasing uh, number of migrants that we are seeing, coupled with the complex and multi-casual nature of migration, a report such as this one, which is going to be launched, uh, could not be more timely as it provides an opportunity for all of us to gain a better sense of some of the most important and pressing migration issues of our time. More importantly, the World Migration Report 2018 provides the much needed evidence-based information which is often lacking in many uh, current discussions on migration. And as I said, uh, the period we are entering into is key and we need to be well informed uh, as we uh, negotiate the global compact on uh, migrant. Uh, furthermore, in a region such as Africa, where reliable information on migration is often uneven and fragmented. This report is an important contribution and a useful source of key data and information on migration. Uh, this is especially central for policymakers as accurate data and information is key to formulating appropriate responses and policies on various migration issues. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, focusing on Africa, which is the continent I come from, uh, we have uh, a common perspective, which of course Uganda shares. And first of all, it is important to note that the vast majority of African migrants still move within Africa. And this dynamic has expanded uh, uh, significantly over the last decade. So we, w what do we need to do in order to keep pace with this expansion? It is very important for us in Africa to be able to put down what we think is important for us to be able to address this development uh, on our continent. Um, at the continental level, the various AU, African Union policy framework and instruments on migration contain recommendations on how to promote the benefits of migration improve capacity for migration management, and enhance mobility on the continent, as well as address the challenges of irregular migration. As recently as uh, the, tw the, the, the 25th uh, African Union Summit, which was held in Johannesburg, the African leaders deliberated extensively on how to effectively manage migration by committing to achieve a comprehensive range of issues by 2018. So this is why I say the year 2018 for us is very important because of you know, these developments that, uh, that are coming up. Uh, this uh, comprehensive uh, range of issues include, if I may uh, mention just a few, uh, improving labor mobility by establishing harmonized mechanism, thereby ensuring that higher education in Africa is compatible, uh, comparable to, to enable recognition of credentials that will facilitate transferability of knowledge, 
skills and expertise. Operationalizing existing action plans to combat uh, issues like uh, human trafficking and smuggling of migrants. And uh, we also uh, look at the, the speeding up of the implementation of continent-wide visa-free regimes, including issuance of visa at ports of entry for Africa. So this is a, a, a strategy that the African continent is trying to come up with in order to address the issue of migration. Now, while we uh, put in effort to address these issues within the continent, we are also uh, ready and prepared to join hand with all the, 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 the co other continents of the world to be able to come up with a concrete, effective framework that will help us to address these issues in the years to come. Now, um, if I can briefly look at... Uh, the different, a different perspective on migration between the African continent and other parts of the world. I, I, this is uh, an issue that is usually very difficult to understand uh, because we have a, a number of perspectives depending on where we are standing. The people in Africa have a different perspective uh, on migration from the people in Europe, for example, simply because, as we will all accept, the flow of mi mi migration, as we see in the recent crisis, has been from the south to the north. So th this is the reality, and it's a fact that we must accept and be able, in order to be able to address the, the challenges. Uh, between Africa and the, the other continents, especially the global, uh, I mean the developed north, a, a large differences exist in how the issue of migration is perceived and how it should be managed. Now, yet within these divergent narratives, there exists area of convergence between Africa and the rest of the world, which we can build upon. And we intend to pursue this in the process of the global compact, uh, 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 the, the process of uh, putting in place the, the global compact will help us I mean, we'll facilitate this uh, uh, process. Then, uh, w within the, uh, the developed North, the emphasis is more strongly on the containment of irregular and, I mean, unregulated and irregular migrant flows, as well as reducing the number of arriving refugees. But the African position puts more emphasis on facilitating and better managing intra-African migration and mobility, as well as creating legal migration opportunities. So these are the differences in the perspectives from our own uh, point of view and uh, the point of view of the, the, the rest of the world, which we think we need to exploit in order to come up with an effective uh, uh, global uh, compact on migration. So ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, you, you, you'll be able to, 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 to read more about this uh, perspective from the, the report that is going to be uh, launched. And uh, as I said earlier, 
we are very, very uh, grateful to IOM for having come up with a very useful uh, source of information for our participation in uh, uh, putting in place a framework uh, that will help us to address the, uh, the migration challenges in the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Benedict Le Lequia, for, for your insights also. I think that in the interest of time, <laughs> I won't make any summary of this at all. I couldn't if I wanted to, probably. It's very complex. So I think we'll open the floor immediately. I think we can squeak over to maybe five past one because we have another, we have a side event coming up. So let me open the floor. Uh, please uh, let me know who would wish to speak first. Partly because you haven't had an opportunity to see the volume yet, and I apologize for that, but we will distribute, I think, immediately after this, right? Okay. All right. I realize uh, we're standing between you and lunch, so. <laughs> but thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your interest. I hope that you will find this volume of great value as you work on your own migration policies and come back to us, even during the general debate, if you want to make comments on the World Migration Report, it would be entirely in order. So thank you for your good attendance at this meeting. And I would remind you that um, we should be back sharply at 3 p.m. We have a very important panel on migration and climate change. We have a distinguished panel, including uh, French Minister Hulot, who has this whole portfolio, and a number of other distinguished speakers. So let's be back at 3, and I invite those of you who can make it to remain here for a very important side event uh, sponsored by the Holy See, in which there will be a number of uh, interesting panelists. Thank you very much. <laughs>